Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, I'm Mike Tuffery from Corporate Citizenship. Delighted. Sorry, and I'm Rebecca Fay from Natural Capital Partners. Good. Uh, so welcome to everybody. Welcome to our joint webinar from Corporate Citizenship and Natural Capital Partners. Beyond business as usual, uh, aligning business strategy and climate action with the SDGs. Uh, we've got an hour together. Uh, this isn't about the theory of the SDGs, what they are, where they come from, how many there are. It's very much about the practical side, how companies are engaging with that agenda, both making a contribution and benefiting from it, both overall and specifically on climate action. So let me introduce the team for today. So there's me, Mike Tuffery. I'm joined by my colleague, Nana. Uh, we're going to start off together with examples of the overall approach that companies are using. We'll share with you the results of some research that we've done, and we'll offer you a map of, of the journey. Uh, and we'll end our section with a poll to see where you're at uh, on your stage of the journey. We'll then hand over to Rebecca and Sarah. Uh, they'll introduce themselves fully uh, when um, when we get there, they're going to get into detail, particularly on the climate action side, and they too will have a poll uh, to get some response from you. And then thirdly, we'll hand over to Nishant and Jack from ING, and they're going to talk us through their journey, again, overall and specifically on uh, climate action. So we've only got an hour together, and if we keep the pace up, which we intend to, we'll have some time at the end uh, for questions and answers. Um, so you're all in uh, muted in listen-only mode, so if you can please use the panel on the right-hand side of the screen to submit any questions. Uh, we'll monitor that during the webinar and come to them at the end and try and get some answers. And as I mentioned, we're running two live polls during the webinar, so when you get there, please do participate uh, and, your, uh, and give us your responses. Uh, we'll show the results on the screen. Uh, so that's what we've got in store for you. Uh, let's get started. So first off, from me, just a brief introduction about corporate citizenship. Uh, my role there is I'm one of the co-founders 20 years ago. Don't know where those two decades went. Uh, we started with a team of two, and we now have about 50 people across six offices around the world. And we work with uh, mainly large international companies on the whole journey to be a more responsible and sustainable business. Um, we do a lot of thought leadership and research and hold events like this. Um, on the SDGs in particular, we uh, have done a number of studies which you can find on our website. We've got a little microsite part of that. Um, uh, a whole set of research over several years um, and various papers that you can download. Uh, so please do visit afterwards. So that's just a bit about us. Just um, to set the scene, I just wanted to pick one example because there's a huge variety of practice out there among companies. Um, some are at the, at the start of their, their journey. Some are trying to map out uh, the route they're going to take. Others, uh, the SDGs, don't offer a route map. They offer more of a, a validation and a spur to action. Unilever would be, which is a client that we do a lot of work for, widely seen as one of the leaders, just wanted to highlight um, that because they have their own plan, they have a committed leadership and a clear sense of what they're doing, um, the SDGs are more a validation and a, and a, 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 of what they're doing. On their website, you'll find a, a map across against all 17 goals uh, and where they're making a contribution. They've perhaps done more at the systemic level. Uh, Paul Polman chaired the Business and Sustainable Development Commission. Um, we were pleased to participate in the early research, uh, and you should take a look at their results. There's a screenshot there on the, on the screen. Uh, that report sets out the business case very nicely. 60 hotspots identified, 12 trillion of economic value if we get this SDG uh, agenda right. So that's just a brief introduction. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Nana, who's going to talk you through the latest research findings and then our approach that gives you a route map to action. Over to you, Nana. Great. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nana Guar, and I'm a senior consultant at Corporate Citizenship, and I lead on our SDG services. Um, and I've also led on some of the research um, that we've been doing over the last couple of years. 
Um, as part of our most recent research, um, we've actually been looking at a sample of the largest 50 FTSE 100 companies, um, a relatively small sample, but one nevertheless with significant impact on global markets. Um, based on publicly available information, so far we found that, um, put up some numbers in our research, that uh, a little over two-thirds of these companies have voiced some type of public support uh, for the SDGs, which is good news. However, 70% are not actually doing anything differently in response to the challenges that the global goals um, have set before us, which is slightly concerning. And of the companies that are taking some form of action, we found that 38% have set new targets for their contributions to the SDGs. Uh, 20 8% have created new internal programs around the SDGs and 34% of companies have created external programs. And what these numbers are telling us is that um, whilst awareness is there, um, the transition from awareness has kind of been slow and, and not as um, robust as, as we would kind of expect or would have liked to see. So. What we've also observed is that, you know, not all companies are at the same stage in their journey um, and, and taken as a whole, um, even though kind of the numbers that we've seen don't paint an optimistic picture, there are pockets of activity and engagement um, at, at different aspects of the, at different stages of um, kind of engaging with, with the SDGs. So, at corporate citizenship, what we've done is that we've mapped this journey across four kind of broad stages, which may resonate with where your company might be. And the four stages are think, act, measure, and engage. And we've come up with a little tame acronym. Um, so basically, companies that are at the think stage are those that are assessing where they currently are and how they can align their strategies and their programs uh, to the most material SDGs. So we would have seen a lot of mapping um, and alignment of business strategy to SDG goals and Unilever has, you know, has done that, um, which Mike referred to earlier. Um, companies within the ACT stage of their journey have taken the next step to develop specific strategies or programs that address some of the 2030 stretch goals. Companies that are at the measurement stage of their journey are those who have kind of set targets and have some type of measurement framework to assess their impact um, and enable them to also communicate progress uh, to their stakeholders. And then the last um, stage is around engagement. And those are companies that are beginning to collaborate or partner um, with wider stakeholder um, groups. So over the next kind of few slides, I'll highlight some practical examples of companies that are at different stages of the journey. Um, worth mentioning that, you know, it, being at a certain stage isn't mutually exclusive from other stages and every company is moving at its own pace. Um, so I'll just go through a few examples, beginning with Vodafone. Um, so Vodafone, I think, is a good example of a company that has integrated SDG thinking into its strategy. Um, they've looked at how their networks, their products, and their services, as well as the work of Vodafone Foundation, all can impact, have an impact on specific SDGs. And I think they identified um, specifically something like five SDGs to focus on. However, um, they do acknowledge that they're supporting um, all the other SDGs to a certain degree as well. And what they've done is articulate this in a strategic framework um, and it's, it's articulated and communicated kind of on their website. So I think again that's a great example of a company taking a holistic view of the global goals through their business lens. The next example um, that we found interesting was 
um, one that we found on Relics with Relics Group, and they've provided. Relics is a company that provides information and analytics for business uh, customers across different industries globally. And you might wonder how a company that provides analytical information could contribute to the SDGs. Um, and what they've essentially done is that they've taken their core competence and they've created an SDG resource center, which showcases the latest in science, law, business, and events that can help drive forward the SDGs. And their aim is to support implementation of the goals um, by broadening awareness and increasing understanding uh, for their customers, for governments, for researchers, companies, NGOs, etc. And I think what's notable about uh, Relics Group is that they've identified an opportunity um, to turn to turn their engagement with the SDG into actually with the SDGs into a product and a service offer. Um, and so rather than thinking about how they can contribute to the SDGs, they're also thinking about how the SDGs um, can contribute to their business. And the next uh, example, and I'll also highlight, is with Standard Chartered. And again, this is, this is one that kind of highlights how um, a company can set and measure targets around the goals. So Standard Chartered have gone through a process of mapping their contributions to specific goals. They've gone a step further to set quantifiable business targets. Um, and I think most notably time frames with which they can within which they hope to achieve um, those targets. Um, and you know we see quite a lot of companies grappling with trying to align targets with what's been defined by the UN, um, whereas the UN targets weren't specifically designed for business audiences. So this is a way that you know companies can also kind of think through what it is they want to achieve and how it is they want to measure um, their progress towards those goals. And the final example I'll mention um, is around uh, engagement. So Safaricom Limited, which is one of the largest mobile operators in the Kenyan market, servicing of over 23 million co customers, has taken a very kind of robust and proactive approach to internal engagement. And they've called this a top-down, bottom-up co-creation approach, which is a mouthful. Um, but what they've essentially done is um, engaged with both their senior leadership as well as sustainability champions in parallel to develop a framework for integrating the SDGs into their corporate strategy. Um, so at the top there, you'll see the CEO has set out the broad um, aspiration and statement around transforming lives, but within each of their business units, so including their consumer business units, strategy and innovation, corporate affairs, they've all taken accountability for actually defining their own unique commitments and mission statements around the goals. And um, it's underpinned by action plans, targets, and KPIs that keep them accountable um, and establish ownership over that. So I'll just pause there. Those are a whistle stop tour of some of the kind of good practice examples that we're seeing. Um, and I'll hand over to Mike. Thanks, Anna. So there we have it. Think, act, measure. Uh, engage. Uh, not everybody fits that. It'll be interesting to see when we talk to our colleagues from ING uh, later in the webinar how that maps across to their journey. But some people find that helpful. And we're now going to have a quick poll before we move on uh, just to see uh, for those on this uh, webinar uh, where you're at with the journey. So, which of the following options is your organization pursuing? Uh, with regard to the SDGs, are you at the thinking stage, the acting stage, the measuring stage, or the engaging stage, and tick all that apply. And then hopefully, if it works, we'll see there's a journey. Um, or there's also wait and see, <laughs> or don't know, or stop the world, I want to get off, um, uh, for those of you that are very much at the beginning of the process. So colleagues here will tell me um, when we've had a decent response. Keep voting, vote early, vote often. Um, pick, uh, tick, as I say, all those that will apply. And then if the system works, we'll get a sense of um, the, the journey. OK, so we're going to close the poll. And the answers are uh, most people are still at the thinking stage, which is reflects 
the poll, uh, the, the research that we did and, and um, feedback, the truth is even though we are two years into the process, uh, a lot of companies really are only in the foothills of this, but it's good to see um, uh, there's some acting, uh, measuring, which and not surprising is the, the smallest option because uh, that is quite tricky and getting a company measurement across to the SDG's own indicators is quite tough. Um, and then a lot of engaging going on, uh, but perhaps not enough if I can uh, give an opinion on that. Mm -hmm. So actually that's a perfect uh, cue for our natural capital partners colleagues um, to give us um, uh, some examples of what you can actually do about it. Over to you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you, Mike, for that lovely segue over to me. So yes, I think what I'm going to be able to talk about is some of, act, some of uh, clients in that acting stage of uh, the SDG options. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work our clients are doing uh, to deliver SDG impact and how they're aligning this with their environment and specifically their emission reduction goals. Um, Natural Capital Partners uh, specializes in working with companies to meet their environmental targets through external projects, in particular the support of carbon finance projects to offset their emissions and through renewable energy certificates. We've been doing this for about 20 years now and uh, we have about 300 clients in 34 countries, including companies such as Microsoft, Marks and Spencers, Sky, Bain and ING. Um, as I've said, we specialize in carbon finance projects and the last, over the last few years we've seen a really interesting evolution in the way that businesses get value from this sort of external program. Six or seven years ago, clients wanted to meet their greenhouse gas reduction target and that was the simple focus. Carbon finance projects follow third party standards to demonstrate that they're delivering emissions reductions and they have to be validated and verified regularly by independent auditors. However, then as companies met their targets, they wanted to evolve the story they had to tell and there was an increasing interest in what was then referred to as the co-benefits of projects. So there was a really simple divide between efficient projects that were very effectively delivering emissions reductions, wind in China for instance, and what were often referred to as more charismatic projects, efficient cookstoves which not only reduce carbon emissions but also provide health benefits through reduced indoor air pollution would be a good example. All carbon finance projects have to prove that they finance, the finance that they get from carbon and their carbon emissions reductions is critical to their viability. So the emission reductions are genuinely additional for all these projects. But some have these added benefits to households and communities and biodiversity. About three years ago, Imperial College London did some research that assessed the value of what was still called co-benefits at that stage, but obviously closely aligned to the SDGs. The research calculated that for every tonne of carbon emission reduction, approximately $664 is delivered in additional value through things like employment, financial savings and biodiversity conservation. In the last couple of years, that co-benefit story has become even more critical. The majority of our clients now want their environmental programs to align with other business goals. So for instance, Microsoft uses carbon finance projects in data center locations to align with other community engagement programs in those countries. A particularly good example of this is Taylors of Harrogate, which is a tea and coffee company based in the UK. Taylor's is supporting carbon finance projects directly in the supply chain to support the smallhold farmers that are really critical to the quality of its, product, of its product. In Kenya, this is through a community reforestation project. Taylor's is able to offset its emissions through the carbon from, from the trees that are planted by the tea farmers. But even more importantly, the farmers are able to improve their financial and food security through conservation farming techniques, improved land productivity, and new income streams from things like fruit trees and beekeeping. The SDGs provide the framework that enables clients to position their work and impact consistently and credibly in language that everyone else is using, and provides us with a set of clear targets that helps us to evaluate those additional benefits that carbon finance projects deliver. The emission, the emission reduction has almost become like the anchor tenant and gives a guarantee of quality because it must be measured, monitored and verified. 
but the SDG impact is critical to ensuring businesses get value from their programs. So now, when we evaluate potential projects that might meet our clients' requirements, we've added a whole new level of assessment to consider their additional activities within the context of the SDG targets. Although a project's activities may appear to directly align with the SDGs, it is really critical that we understand how to measure these impacts in a robust and transparent way. Within each goal is a set of targets that provide specific direction for addressing that SDG, and we're working with our project partners to gather and monitor results against the relevant SDG targets. So, for instance, this uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa Cookso project, for example, it helps to reduce indoor air pollution, leading to improved health, SDG 3. It reduces the time women and children spend collecting fuel wood, contributing to gender equality, which is SDG 5. And it consequently alleviates pressure on local woodlands, which helps to conserve life on, life on land, SDG 15. Reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation, otherwise known as RED projects, for example, this one in Indonesia, also frequently impacts several of the SDGs. RED projects clearly conserve forest habitat and wildlife, SDG 15, and often they implement community-based activities that can improve food security, SDG 2, and they create jobs, SDG 8, and improve local infrastructure. SDG 9. And as a final example, in Guatemala, this project provides water filters to schools and households to deliver clean water in a country where uh, stomach upsets and diarrhea are particularly critical to the health of communities. That clean water provision comes fits with SDG 6, which also improves health, SDG 3, and it saves households money on fuel to boil the water, which is the alternative, SDG 1. So as you can see, the carbon emission reduction part of projects like this rapidly becomes just one piece of the story. And before I hand over to Sarah, we have another poll. So what we would like you to tell us is to what extent your carbon reduction and your social impact programs are linked. As I've just shown you, we have a lot of clients who are doing that, who are linking up the SDGs with their environmental programs and their carbon reduction programs. It would be really interesting to us to find out what, where you fit in that poll. So the poll is open to show whether they are strongly linked, they are somewhat linked, they are not linked at all, or it's something you're interested in exploring this, in exploring further. You'll note we haven't given you the option of you don't care, because we don't, <laughs> we're, hope, we're optimistic that that's not the case. Um, so I'll just leave that poll for a minute. I'm waiting to hear when we've got enough, and we're ready to close the poll now. So, ah, here you can see a really interesting spread. It's a pretty even spread amongst all of those things. They're strongly linked somewhat linked, not linked at all, we're interested in exploring this further, it's pretty even, I wouldn't say there's anyone particularly that comes up top, so you, we can see there's a good mix of businesses um, looking at that quandary right now and seeing how they can improve it, which is a really nice link into uh, Sarah Loigas from Gold Standard, who is going to talk about the work Gold Standard is doing to take that combination of climate impact and development impact to a whole new level. So I'm very pleased to hand over to Sarah. Indeed, thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, Rebecca has already done a, a great job in, in painting the picture and, and creating a, a snapshot of the journey and, and the reason for why Gold Standard for the Global Goals has come to fruition. And in fact, it's hot off the press, as it were. The, the standard was just published uh, on Monday last week. Um, so let's talk about what it, what it means and what it's all about. Um, the Gold Standard for the Global Goals is indeed um, an evolution from those co-benefits that Rebecca had been describing to core SDG impacts to ensure that the, the measurement and the reporting of those impacts is, in, is very robust and it's, and it's credible. Um, for those of, those, who don't of those of you who don't know Gold Standard, um, we were created to ensure the highest levels of environmental integrity and we're the first really to introduce sustainable development into carbon mitigation projects under the Kyoto Protocol. 
and became quickly the, the benchmark standard in carbon markets. And so now with the new Paris Climate Agreement and the, the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, Gold Standard has now integrated what were previously three separate standards for energy projects, land use in forests, and water, all of um, those that, that Rebecca has outlined, into one holistic standard and one framework that a broad range of activities can use to quantify, certify, but most importantly, to maximize their impacts to the SDGs. And here you just see a, a sample of our strategic partners who are engaged with us at, at different levels of the standard development and the deployment and bringing it to market. So if we look at the next slide, you'll see a, a key feature of gold standard for the global goals and, and something that's been a hallmark of gold standard since our inception in 2003 is that we've always embedded sustainable development into our core and this is long before the SDGs came around. Um, but now with this next generation standard, we're taking this a step further and this happens both at the process level or the project design level and also at the performance level where we're measuring impacts. And the reason this is important at the design level is that it, it really de-risks projects and provides a, the foundation for credibility to then go make these performance claims. So for example, if you consider implementing a new forestry project or an agricultural project um, that requires water, as those projects do, um, that has the potential to uh, restrict water access downstream. So, um, or if, you know, potentially there are um, governance issues in, within the project boundary, those are, those are really important aspects to mitigate before you can really credibly claim on performance. So in this new standard, we further strengthen important cross-cutting SDG safeguards, for example, uh, those around gender equality and around water access. Um, also at the design level, Local and affected stakeholders must be engaged as part of the development process and ensure that the that a project is benefiting that local community. And then at the prof, at the performance level, projects must deliver impacts to at least three different SDG targets. And these, of course, are rigorously quantified, third party verified, and then finally certified by gold standard. And the reason these Sustainable development provisions are very important is that if you want to make credible claims and not be exposed to any accusations of greenwashing or SDG washing, um, it's really important to have these in place. And so let's take now a look at the different applications of the standard. Uh, how is it used? Uh, in, the, in the past, as we've described, gold standard was operating as the benchmark for projects issuing carbon credits and carbon markets. Um, but the integration of these different scope areas of the standard and, and new flexible certification options means that gold standard for the global goals is now relevant in, for instance, um, different dimensions of environmental markets, for instance, in renewable energy markets. And I'll get into the details of that in a moment. But beyond, if you start moving to the right um, of these boxes here, it also can allow funders to sponsor exactly the SDG impacts that are their priorities. And this opens the door further to innovative finance mechanisms like so social impact bonds, development impact bonds with specific SDG impacts in mind, so that investors that are interested or businesses that are interested particularly in certain ecosystem services or gender lens investors can fund those specific impacts on a paper performance or results-based finance basis. But then this also means that business can use the standard to de-risk their projects of different initiatives with the safeguards, safeguards and stakeholder engagement that I've described, and then measure the impact of, for instance, su sustainable supply chain efforts or large-scale initiatives like green infrastructure, sustainable urban development, or landscape-level interventions. So that's the broad kind of range of applicability. And let's take a look now at some of the impacts, of the very specific SDG impacts that the standard can measure and certify today. Um, the first, as I've mentioned, is a quality label in the renewable energy market. So just as the Gold Center label was originally designed to ensure the highest levels of environmental integrity and sustainable development for carbon credits, we're taking the same approach here. 
Um, we'll start first with, with IREX. Um, but the, the key objective, it, it, might, it will then scale beyond IREX, but really the, the key objective un, uh, underlying this label is to provide buyers of REX with the assurance that their purchase is making a measurable difference in driving the transition to renewable energy. That renewable capacity will be added to the grid as a result of the, of the purchase. And then again, like all gold standard projects, they must follow the safeguarding principles and must contribute to multiple SDGs. So again, as, as Rebecca outlined, this additional SD value created from a single carbon credit, the same will be true of each gold standard labeled renewable energy instrument. So more SDG impact for your investment. The next impact, um, SDG 6, water, um, noted again and again as the, as the top global risk that um, needs urgent attention. Um, in light of that, in 2014, Gold Standard introduced uh, a water benefit standard. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we've integrated this into the overall framework, but the principles and requirements of that standard are now integrated into Gold Standard for the global goals. So if, if water is a, a key SDG focus for your business, say you're in a you know, food and beverage or in uh, fashion, you can purchase water benefit certificates, which will quantify the volume of water purified, supplied, or conserved. And again, just as with all impacts, they're quantified and verified, come from strong projects with additional SDG benefits. And next, we'll look at health. Um, the standard now is able to quantify and certify health impacts for those uh, businesses who have health as a priority uh, contribution to the SDGs. Um, the methodology that we've developed to quantify these impacts um, was developed in association with the World Health Organization, the World Bank, um, a, a leader, uh, Berkeley Air Monitoring Group, and, and many others. Um, and it uses a, as its unit what's called an A-daily, which is an averted disability adjusted life year and is really a, a measurement of morbidity and mortality. It's a way of accurately measuring not only the, the positive health impact at a humanitarian level, which everyone cares about, of course. Um, so it tells you how many, the number of years a person is healthy and productive, but it can also compare directly economic costs of the burden of disease so that you know if a given intervention that preventing a, um, something like the, the negative health impacts from indoor air pollution, for instance, by cooking over open fire, you know that that's a more cost-effective treatment uh, or, or intervention related to covering the cost of treating uh, whatever diseases or disabilities come as a result. So the first use case for this is will apply to clean cook stove projects. Um, and, and this really is a, a demonstration of, of where we see the health impacts of reducing something like toxic indoor air pollution, moving from a co-benefit of the reduction of uh, carbon emissions to act accurately quantifying and reporting on, on real health impacts of these life-saving projects. So it's really, uh, really exciting new methodology that will uh, be applied to projects starting uh, later this year. And then finally, um, a, a, an impact that's a bit uh, le further behind in, the, in development is, is the one around gender equality. But at the, at the process level, at the safeguard level, we have built uh, stronger safeguards around gender equality into our process so that projects must not only do no harm in terms of gender equality, um, but they also must actively engage women and men and maximize positive impacts for gender equality in, in a given context. So all projects that are gold standard will be uh, follow gender sensitive principles. And then when we talk about the performance level, we're also developing metrics to measure several important indicators of gender equality. And you'll see some of these here. Women's economic empowerment, reductions in time poverty um, as a result of performing unpaid labor, collecting fuel or firewood or long time cooking, um, as well as in women's voice and agency and ensuring that women have um, access to land rights, for instance, or dec decision-making power in the issues that affect them. So these, the, the, the ability to 
quantify impacts uh, around gender equality is currently in development and will be piloted at the end of this year starting next. So as you see, we're, we're moving on a progression. Um, if you move to the next slide, you'll see um, how we're looking forward. We'll continue to build on our pipeline of SDG impacts. Um, we're also launching um, something that might be interesting, very interesting to, uh, to corporates is, is the launching of a program with the science-based targets partners that will enable credible but cost-effective reporting of scope three emissions reductions within the supply chain. So moving from, uh, in addition to being able to contribute outside your operations, also looking inside the offense and also allowing these um, reductions to count towards a science-based target and also capturing the SDG impact. So really having a robust way to report on supply chain interventions. Uh, we'll start first at the, with the agricultural supply chain but we'll be looking, we'll be interested in, in convening corporate leaders and other stakeholders like natural capital partners and other, others that we work with to, to co-create new tools and methodologies beyond those that I've mentioned today. And so this would present an opportunity to collaborate with different stakeholders and even with your peers along value chains to develop new solutions to shared challenges uh, and really scale up approaches to quantify, certify, and again, maximize uh, climate De uh, and sustainable development contributions. So we would welcome input from those of you on the call uh, and to, about getting involved and define what we develop next, um, and what is important to you, what would help um, accelerate your progress towards the SDGs and, and gain recognition for it. So that great. is, that's our overview. Yep, over great. to you. Mike. That's great. And thank you also, Rebecca, for your contribution. I think the picture is emerging clearly. It's not a question of picking kind of one goal and just saying what contribution contribution you can make. It's about finding the, the ways of joining that up, maximizing the impact, and then exactly as Sarah is saying, uh, quantifying and certifying that um, where that's appropriate, and then linking that to your corporate strategy so it makes sense for the business and it isn't just a kind of one-way contribution out to the world. Uh, it helps you drive your business, grow your business, and then it becomes truly sustainable. So that's the proposition. Let me hand over to our colleagues from ING, Nishant and Jack, who will give us a, a snapshot of the reality of the journey you've been on. Over to you guys. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, so I think what uh, Nana Kaur mentioned about the, and the question poll that was there on the think, act, measure and engage uh, was a really critical word and also for us uh, it was a journey to start from thinking to acting to measuring and also engaging. So I think uh, we, we are on a right track. However, I would not say we have reached the final destination yet because it's the journey that needs to be continued. So Jack and I will be giving you a short overview on how we move forward. So before we just start, uh, I would like to give you a brief overview of what ING is in the next slide. So uh, ING is a global financial institute uh, which has a very strong European focus uh, and we are active in more than 40 countries. We offer retail and wholesale banking services uh, and we need to also understand that as a bank, uh, an impact that we create on the society is more relevant through our financing or through our customers and impact decisions rather than more of our entire, uh, our own operations or our suppliers in that matter. So just to give you a bit of a context on how ING's strategy, sustainability strategy is uh, going, uh, is developed, if you go to the next slide, uh, we, we can see that uh, we are currently focusing on two key uh, societal challenges or societal themes, uh, which is one, if you look at it quite closely, one is environmental and the second is social. Uh, so we see a social trend of uh, moving fintechs, unemployment and withdrawing governments, at the same time environmental trends in decarbonization of assets, circular economy and human rights as well. So if you look at translate that into customer challenges, what we observe is a financial anxiety amongst our retail customers, but at the same time, we need to future-proof our own balance sheet by focusing on sectors or industries that are more resilient to the uh, to, 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 to to the climate change, for example, and to the sectors such as uh, oil and gas, fossil fuels. How can we reduce our portfolio or our exposure to that? 
So an answer to answer to these uh, questions or challenges was uh, the two pillars that come forward, which is the financial empowerment on how we can uh, uh, drive decisions uh, of our customers to make them more financially resilient. We do this by providing clear products and services, providing them with the right information at the right time, uh, and also by creating impact on communities uh, in, the, in, in, in the communities where we operate. And on the sustainable transition side, uh, we are really looking towards a focus on customers, uh, on how we can enable them to make, uh, enable them to uh, go make sustainable decisions by focusing on pro renewable projects, wind farms, uh, by developing a hospital in Nigeria, for example. So how can we uh, really transition towards that? Uh, now, if you go to the next slide. Uh, well, our commitment with the United Nations uh, has been since 2006, where we first signed the UN Global Compact, uh, where uh, here we already started reporting on our progress on the, the four, four core principles of uh, human rights, environmental uh, compliance, uh, but then it, ma it made a tra natural transition for us to move towards the SDGs, uh, and we support this initiative, and then what we try to do and what we try to achieve uh, through our um, inside out and outside in mapping is to link the SDGs with our strategy. So if you go to the next slide, we used uh, two perspectives. So we used an inside out perspective. So looking into what uh, our current strategy looks into, uh, what are the key focus areas, and also reaching out to different internal stakeholders within different countries. Uh, and we used an outside-in perspective where we reviewed the SDGs uh, from a more holistic perspective, looking into targets, what are the key targets that, res uh, that resonate with our, within our strategy, and where, we, where could we have a material impact. We also looked into several tools such as SDG Compass, which is a very important tool on which, tries, which tries to tell you on which SDGs and what SDGs do you need to focus on. We also looked at into the several sector supplements on what sector, within a sector, what are the key material SDGs that you need to focus on. Uh, and we also looked at to several reporting frameworks to come up with a key focus areas. And what really came out well was 8 and 12 being a very strategic fit, focused on our customers, uh, focused on uh, what we do and what our ambitions are. Uh, and if we move to the next slide, we look into more concrete examples uh, within the SD, within the SDG eight. Uh, we uh, we contribute to it. Uh, we we are quite active, or we feel uh, we have an important contribution in microfinance. We have been promoting and increasing our resources in microfinance for over twelve years. Uh, for this, we created a, a research report, and we also started an accompanying conference for six years. Uh, Within this report, we are trying to cover several uh, wide range of topics to provide microfinancing services to small to medium scale businesses and how we can promote them. Uh, our 2016 report and our re conference on a billion to gain uh, particularly focus on how innovative technologies can help uh, SMEs and mid corps uh, in, in, in capitalizing on the financial opportunities that are there. And I think this SDG 8 clearly resonates with that and as, as ING being an innovative company we would want to focus more in a, more through innovation. If you go to the next slide we see SDG 12 which is uh, next to how we contribute to that is through our orange ING orange circle program which is completely focused on circular economy from ownership to access. Here we try to focus on five core areas being knowledge, operations, deals, ecosystem, and innovation. Knowledge where we want to create an expertise within uh, our bank. Operations where we are also uh, focusing on how can we purchase circular products. Deals where we are focusing on relationship with circular clients. Uh, on ecosystem development where we can work more on circular business models with other financial partners such as private equity or investment offices and also innovation how we can work together with clients on developing circular propositions so taking a step further we already signed a groundbreaking deal uh, with by the merger of Shanks and Van Kessel Vanken Group uh, which is one of to create one of the most leading uh, circular economy companies uh, uh, 
And yes, now I hand over uh, to Jack, who will further explain how we contribute to not only just the two focus areas, but also to other SDGs. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Jack, and um, I am the sorry, Global Environmental Program Manager here at ING. Um, so a key uh, strategy of our environmental program is to be a carbon neutral bank. Uh, so we re remain a carbon neutral bank by offsetting our additional carbon emissions uh, through the purchasing of uh, voluntary carbon units in projects like Selco in India, and that's in partnership with uh, NCP. So uh, Selco, a really interesting project uh, and a joint initiative with uh, Natural Capital Partners. It provides uh, sort of underserved households with solar energy access. Um, so it distributes sort of rare projects, including solar lighting, solar water heating, solar photovoltaics. Um, uh, and also with the support of the carbon finance, this project aims to empower uh, sort of these, these users. And this, this is really close to our core purpose of uh, empowering people to stay ahead, step ahead in sort of life and business. So this project in partnership with NCP really helps us um, meet our sort of climate goals and being carbon neutral, but also contributing to other SDGs. Uh, and as we move forward, uh, our goal is to create a more strategic um, carbon strategy, which is a bit more longer term and has uh, more impact. And the SDGs in this regard are very useful uh, in sort of picking the um, social benefits we want for our projects or the societal problems uh, we, which we wish, wish to solve. Uh, and in that way, it's very helpful in communication. So if you go to the next slide, you can see more about our reporting and communication. Um, so quite recently, we developed uh, an online uh, communication tool that shows our contribution to our primary goals uh, of 8 uh, and 12, but as well as uh, a lot of the other SDGs. So this uh, interactive tool allows uh, users, they could be uh, internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, employees, they allow users to explore um, what each of the SDGs uh, represents, uh, and it also shows how we contribute to those SDGs uh, throughout our value chain. Uh, what's useful about the tool is it's sort of a dashboard format, so it allows for continuous reporting and an improvement on how we really communicate on the SDGs. Uh, and we feel it's it's useful as an engagement tool, so we can really inspire teams uh, across ING to develop uh, products, services, projects, or programs that really um, help advance the SDG agenda. Um, so if you look at more at the future, what we're uh, aiming for with the SDGs, you can go to the, the next slide. Um, so we're working uh, with peers uh, in different sectors, uh, clients, uh, as well as several other financial institutions to see how we can really measure uh, the impact on the SDGs in a more quantitative way. Uh, the goal is to sort of incorporate more of this quantitative data into our reporting frameworks uh, and our dashboard. Uh, another thing what we want to do is focus more on the SDG targets because uh, they're really uh, useful uh, in guiding your communications about how you contribute. Uh, so we've carried out various mapping exercises before with other frameworks, for instance the GRI, G4 guidelines, uh, but we want to really incorporate uh, the targets uh, a lot more. So uh, one thing I would like to note about the targets is just like the original SDGs, they are uh, originally designed more so for governments, so some of the targets there is a challenge in translating that into relevant business uh, targets. But uh, again, uh, there are some uh, progress here, so for instance GRI are working on a set of core business KPIs for different sectors that are related to the targets. Uh, we think this will be really helpful uh, for reporting uh, moving forward. Um, and lastly, uh, we are also pushing to uh, integrate the SDGs uh, more um, in our business. So we're always uh, looking to integrate sustainability more, and a key aspect of this is employee engagement. Uh, so one uh, way I'll highlight this is that uh, as, as a bank, we're very innovation focused on financial technology, um, and one way that we um, uh, create new products and services is through things like hackathons, um, or, sustain or uh, innovation events or boot camps. Uh, and these are key in bringing new ideas to, uh, to the fore and really in getting them to market and helping our clients. So moving forward, uh, our goal is to really incorporate the SDGs in these events 
Uh, and that way we hope that uh, the teams involved in product and service creation uh, will really be able to incorporate these into our um, uh, client-facing uh, products. Uh, and that way it'll be a useful tool to sort of create more sort of combined societal uh, and business value. Yeah, so uh, I think that's everything from me. Great, thank you, Jack and Nishant. That's a very powerful story, uh, particularly the where you're going to with this, as well as the the journey you've been on. And I particularly like the link to your, you know, your your strategic focus is is carefully chosen to to fit with your with your business, uh, and then some great. Um, uh, great stories in terms of how you've actually uh, rolled up your sleeves and, and done uh, the action on the ground, the carbon offsetting and so forth, and not forgetting the communication. So really commend that story to everybody on the call and to follow that up afterwards. A perfect timing. Uh, we have 10 minutes left for questions. We've had a great load in. So, and indeed, if you have any specifically on that last presentation, still uh, input them in and we'll try and get to them. Um, there was a question about the, uh, the that survey that we did at Corporate Citizenship right up front from uh, Nicole. That was only of the top uh, 50 of the FTSE um, because we made a start there in terms of the latest picture. We do have other surveys that we've done. Every six months we try and do a snapshot. Um, so if you go to our website you'll find more of that. Um, let me give a first question uh, across to Nana, um, which is to say a little bit more uh, about what other companies are doing to adopt the approach that you set out, Nana, on Relics. So that's that link um, of, the, of, of the SDGs to a product or service uh, so that it's kind of embedded into the business and grows the business. Can you give us any other examples of that and any tips? Um, yes, well, actually, I, I think the, the important kind of takeaway from that is, is really the way that companies think about the SDG shouldn't just be about Kind of what they can do to contribute to achieving the goals but also what opportunities are created um, you know in, in terms of their response and and what um, and and how the SDGs and how the goals really will affect um, their customers or their suppliers or their end users um, if these goals aren't met and to turn kind of flip the question around on its head internally and really look at you know what opportunities are created from that that the company can then um, respond to by either adjusting their services or their products okay yes. that's great thank you Nana uh, one for Rebecca um, uh, this one came in from Chloe um, so as well as these projects that you've been talking about do you think that if companies develop a culture of sustainability whether that kind of accelerates the uh, the transition to a sustainable future and I'm just interested in how you combine your kind of practical action on the ground with the, the kind of business case and the corporate rationale for that um, yeah, I mean, I think there's no doubt that if there's a corporate culture of sustainability, then that transition is going to be accelerated. And I think there's a few different ways that we've seen clients trying to do that. Um, one thing that I think is really critical is um, that, that, as I talked about, linking the projects to something that's relevant to the business. And what Jack and Nishab were talking about from ING was a really fantastic example of that, where they have selected projects which they can, where they can demonstrate that sort of financial element that links to ING's um, own business. I think that's really important because. On the one hand, I would say, you know, we always say to our clients, you need to get senior management to really be speaking up for this sort of program, because if they demonstrate that it's important for them, then that sort of environmental action and sustainability program is more likely to filter through the business. But at the same time, you want the sort of bottom-up approach where people throughout the business can make an association with what it means to them personally, the sort of environmental action that's being taken and sustainability. So I think the communication is really important to have sort of both of those ends of the spectrum coming together from the senior management down to, you know, all the people, you know, working through the organization, but it needs to be not just a sort of diktat of this is what we're going to do, but put it in the context of what it means for them personally. One thing, two things I would say that we have seen 
uh, clients do also, which really starts to drive that corporate culture, particularly on environmental action. I mean, obviously, the obvious one is internal reductions. No, um, we don't have any clients who just offset their emissions. They all have key, you know, significant programs for internal reductions as well. And that is really critical to make programs a success. But the other thing we've seen some clients do very successful is the internal carbon pricing. Um, programs whereby and Microsoft, which has published several white papers on this, is a very good example of that where they have um, priced carbon through their finance team have been involved in pricing carbon into each business unit and therefore and that that tax on carbon, so to speak, that carbon fee is what goes into a central pot of funds that then funds various uh, climate initiatives within Microsoft, whether they're internal initiatives or their carbon offset and their renewable energy program. So that's a sort of um, a fantastic example of how they that really starts to drive behaviour change and a culture change throughout the business. Yeah, yeah, that, and that helps answer the question we had earlier. Of what are the kind of main barriers to action? And certainly from our perspective, we find that the people in the corporate centre and the specialist teams understand that joining up, uh, understand the business case, but when you get out into the business to talk to marketing people or R&D people or supply chain people, if you go in and say, guys, there are these SDG things, we really ought to be helping, to sometimes, to be frank, you get a, a kind of yawn and go, oh no, not another thing that we have to comply with. Um, and so one of the techniques is, is in fact not to present this as um, a way of delivering the SDGs, but, but to present it exactly as you were saying, uh, Rebecca, as kind of joining all these things up um, and, and um, integrating it with the, um, with the business and the business case internally. Um, so that's sort of one of the reflections on barriers and then things like carbon pricing, internal prices of carbon and the kind of corporate stuff helps kind of establish that and embed that. Um, now we had a question, we've had a question about financial institutions so I might just turn that over over to, to you go uh, over uh, at ING Nishant and, and Jack um, as to what you see your wider sector doing I was con I'm conscious that the uh, that report I, I mentioned earlier that we contributed to the business and sustainable development Commission better business better world report bit of a mouthful one of their key findings is that achieving the goals will require they put a 2.4 trillion dollar investment on the number I don't know that's precise, but it's certainly a lot of money uh, for infrastructure and projects with long payback periods. Um, guys at ING, can you give us a reflection on, on who else is acting in this space? Who are you working alongside? Uh, which of your, if I can ask you, which of your competitors or your peers are also doing a good job? Um, uh, yes, over to you. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I think it's a really interesting question and it's, I think, something which quite interesting enough. It's something that we would also want to explore and see which of the peers are doing quite extensive work. Uh, I think uh, one of the examples uh, was that was mentioned in this presentation is Standard Chartered, who has uh, also picked up this effort uh, to, uh, to really look into the SDGs. Uh, but alongside that, we are also, there are several investment office or investment uh, and pension fund companies that are really focusing or taking a lead in uh, trying to focus their portfolio and even align their portfolio to uh, several SDGs. Uh, just to give you a brief example on that there are several working groups within here within the Netherlands that are currently focusing on developing impact indicators uh, based on the target underlying targets that are there. To, to really measure uh, eventually the kilotons or the cubic meters of water saved or the kilotons of CO2 avoided in order to uh, really measure uh, what is impact coming out from their entire portfolio. For, from a banking industry perspective, it is still a, a bit uh, of a far stretch to measure our complete impacts since you're always uh, in a horizon or a contractual obligation for five to six years uh, for a particular project. But in terms of investments, it is uh, quite easier, and I think a lot of uh, peers such as uh, P a PGPM and other, other peers uh, such as NM are pick, uh, picking up their efforts also. Great. I'm conscious we're into the closing uh, minute of, of the session, so thank you for that. I'm just looking at the range of questions here. There's a question around quantification and how important that whole measurement um, 
uh, agenda is, I'll just give a 30 second answer, which is, um, and I, perhaps I would say this, wouldn't I, because we do a lot of work in this space, but uh, measuring whether it's yourselves, whether it's working with the gold standard or other appropriate um, uh, approaches in this area is clearly important, but you've got to believe it first. There's got to be a kind of leadership commitment, a tie back to your business mission and your purpose. Um, numbers alone don't kind of win hearts and minds, so we need a both and. I think given the questions, we've got questions here on tracking, uh, we've got questions on different approaches. Um, what I think I'm going to have to do is close it there and suggest that those of you whose questions haven't been answered, I'm afraid, do get in touch with us. So just to uh, give you the housekeeping and the points of contact, um, uh, the webinar has been recorded, so it will be available online. Uh, all those who signed up will receive a, a note as to how to get hold of that and the slides and so forth, so please do have a look and then share that with your colleagues. Um, and if you want to pursue that, uh, this whole question with any of us, whether it's the strategy and mapping and action plans that we at Corporate Citizenship do, whether it's actually rolling up your sleeves, getting working, combining your carbon reduction um, ambitions with all these wider benefits, then uh, please do talk to Rebecca and her colleagues and this all-important question of measurement and standards and certification, uh, please uh, do talk to uh, Sarah and our contact details are there I think on screen now as we speak. So thank you very much, we're on the hour, thank you very much for joining us, I hope that has been helpful, goodbye.